What's that noise? It almost sounds like some sort of alarm. It's not a fire alarm or a smoke, or it's not in my apartment. But, uh, it's getting annoying. Let's just put it that way, it's getting annoying. is going to be the proximity to the river, especially the waterfall over there. Even before the Europeans and the settlers came to the area, the walls were a big draw for people in the area. Dakota in particular has stories associated with the falls and maybe spirits that live beneath it, both malevolent and benevolent. The major story kind of associated with it involved a warrior's wife. Uh, upon finding out that her warrior husband had found a new wife for the family. She took her children and went over the edge of the falls and where they washed up on the bottom side became a very important location. When we get a little bit closer to it, I'll show that to you guys there. Uh, but since then, at least for the Europeans and the people who ended up settling here, the energy they were pulling from the river wasn't spiritual, it was more industrial. Uh, now, like I was saying, this is where all the bodies would wash up as this was one of the first electric plants that were using the falling water to power themselves. A co-worker of mine, his family's been here for a few hundred years. They actually got the first city contract from Minneapolis. They had a funeral home here in the St. Anthony area. They had to pick up all the bodies that were in the river here. Uh, they had two main tools for that, the hook and the net. Uh, not a lot of options there for getting bodies out of the river here. But the story, at least, we like to tell in this area involves the Third Street Bridge over there that's under construction. Uh, a gentleman that was nicknamed the Wolfman was known for this area. 
He was a Vietnam veteran who never properly readjusted to coming home, ended up on the streets abusing alcohol to the level that to satisfy his need, he wouldn't go to the liquor store. Rather, he would go to the camping goods store and buy fuel and burn that down to its pure state. After having some good old ethanol, he would then proceed to howl at the moon, where he earned his nickname of the Wolfman. He was sleeping underneath the Third Street Bridge under some boxes when some kids from the area here with like a high-powered air rifle decided to go underneath and have some target practice. They didn't know that the Wolfman was sleeping there and one of the boxes they shot uh, went through and killed him. So in this area on a full moon's night, if you hear a wolf howl, it's said to be the wolf's man uh, kind of crying out because he never was given a proper veteran's burial. Uh, and kind of this whole area is going to be a little bit more industrial tragic as we go on here. So if you guys do want to grab any photos here with the skyline behind us, I can give you guys like a minute or two. If not, we can start to move on out to the next tour here. Street from us. This is the Pillsbury A Mill. Uh, when it opened, it was the world's largest, most productive flour mill here. Uh, and it was designed for about five years of regular and such. And as there is so much wheat, flour, grain, what have you, in the area, this would have been a heaven on earth, all you can eat buffet if a rodent got into any of that. So the big thing to prevent rodents like rats to getting into that were uh, these walls in the A-Mill and the other buildings would have been lined thick with arsenic and other rat poisons. So the air in there was pretty poisonous for a lot of people. It was well known in the mill that was the case, but not necessarily with the other buildings. This one here behind us would have been the, would have been the machine shop, and this would have been lined with those poisonous walls as well. As the mills started to wind down and activity died out here, uh, people started reporting weird noises coming from various buildings, including the machine shop here. Uh, eventually, a police officer was sent out to investigate. Uh, they spent a few hours investigating the building, but they weren't told of the pretty much poison in the walls. And um, as they were leaving, it started to feel a little weird in their lungs. Within a few weeks, they were diagnosed with cancer and eventually died from the building here. Uh, as you can see by the bright flashing lights going on behind me, a lot of things have changed since then in the 60s to now. Uh, they've renovated the building and turned it into an event center, but the staff at the building here do report weird things happening from windows and doors being shut, silverware and plates being knocked over to just if you're alone in a room you feel like there's someone else in the building, like, like in your presence there. So it's a very weird place. Sometimes people are at the parties like to wave at us or dare point down at us, those are so rude. But uh, the other thing I like to talk about at this stop are these two bridges that greet us as we look down the alleyway there. Uh, now these are connected to these large silos, but when the mill was active, they would have been maintained. But since the mills haven't, they really started to deteriorate. And as we walk under, you'll be able to see two kinds of holes underneath the bridges. One of them looks like a foot fell through. The other one, it looks like both feet fell through. That's because there are a few instances of urban explorers crossing these bridges and falling down, at least one of them to their death. Uh, while it's not uh, concrete at the time they fell, it was pretty much dirt railroad tracks, which isn't very much softer there. Uh, but what these were connected to were these large silos. And again, these were pretty much death traps for a long while. We're gonna be seeing some old retrofitted silos that had safety measures as back in the old days before they had them. Uh, these silos would develop kind of crusty layers. They were packed in so tight and they wouldn't know how much was left over in the silo when there's that layer there. So someone would be sent in to get it unlodged. And since they don't know how much was below there, they might not be able to get out of the silos if they fell in too much. Uh, so they eventually figured out a system to prevent that from happening there that I'll point out to you guys there. Uh, these silos would have been very much death traps, but uh, more than once I've been asked on these tours if when I say silos, these are missile silos. I guess I should confirm, no, these are not missile silos. To the best of my knowledge, no missiles are in there. It would have been just corn and grain and stuff like that. Uh, so we can continue down the alleyway as we head to our next stop. If you guys want to follow me. Drop down, there's nothing stopping you from uh, coming on the ground here. Uh, 
they don't no. go out there as much anymore. I Modern day soap, we think about a lot of different chemicals, exotic fruits, fun name. At this time in the 1800s, soap was pretty much just lion fat, primarily animal fat, but the story, at least at this factory, was it wasn't always the case here. Now, at another location that we'll get to at another stop here, they were having a factory there that was rumored to have been employing, you could say, child laborers. And when they wouldn't show up for work or they got injured on the job, it was said they would wind up here at the soap factory, put into the soap. Uh, normally, if we have kids on the tour, this is where I say, all right, kids, go get, investigate the soap for about five minutes. We're gonna head out to the next stop. Join us then. Uh, but now, the company that actually ran the soap factory here still has a soap company and exists here in the Twin Cities region. I sent them an email a few weeks ago asking them if any of their products currently contain any children in them. They haven't responded yet, but when they do, I'll get that email out to you guys there. Um, now, this was, like I said, it started out as a soap factory, but then as that went out of business, it actually became a prosthetic limb factory as well for the mills. So many people in the nearby area needed one, they put the factory on the premises. Uh, and then after that, it went out of business kind of in the 60s through 70s, the St. Anthony area here was kind of just went, going through transition. But then eventually one of the tenants in the soap factory became an art collective. For a few decades, they had a lot of different events from art shows to music events. But the thing they were most well known for was each year during Halloween, they would have a very intense kind of haunted house experience here, the one where you need to sign a waiver, they get all up in your face, that kind of, I guess, fun stuff to some people there. Uh, but in 2019, they moved out their first year not here. They had their Halloween in a, I think, abandoned supermarket. Then for 2020, they had a, quote, drive-through haunted house, which just sounds like a bad idea waiting to happen, I'll be honest there. And then I didn't see what they did last year. Uh, but since then, this has been kind of our most active spot on the tour, especially in these top windows. We've seen a lot of different orbs and kind of weird spirits there. Uh, for a long while, every time I gave one of these tours, one of the windows along the ground here would be broken at least in one way. Uh, and for the longest time, this was actually the only building that they weren't doing any renovations to. It's only been in the last winter time that they've really stepped it up here. Uh, they're trying to rebrand this building. Uh, on the other side, it says the Switch House. Uh, that's what they're trying. It's a little bit of an interesting story. This actually used to be the only location in all of Minnesota to have an electric chair. Sounds pretty cool, right? Nope, not true but it's more interesting than the story that they tell that is equally not true here. They say this was a switch house, which would have been a small little shack control in the streets and the uh, railroads here. Building this size never would have been used for that. Also, it says established 1880. This was built in 1885. I think my story is better and more interesting and bring more tenants to the building. They won't listen for some reason. I don't get it. Um, so we are actually gonna head on down the rest of the block and then continue to the right as we head to Stone Art Bridge. Stone Arch Bridge, and uh, there's a few things I always like to talk about here. Uh, now, this was constructed because of the A mill over there. Uh, that was finished in 80, 1881. This one was uh, finished in 1883 here. And the person who was proposing the bridge was a gentleman by the name of James J. Hill. He was a railroad baron that had just a very large empire across the United States here. Uh, now, he was well known for being pretty much a cutthroat and no-nonsense kind of uh, business leader here. Now, he loved Scandinavian stone workers for his projects. He was once quoted as saying, give me whiskey, give me snuff, give me Swedes, and I can build you a railroad to hell. So, for the stone arch here, he went to Scandinavia, and the deal was he would pay for passage to America, and then upon completion of the bridge, a plot of land in the Dakota Territory. A lot of workers took them up on the completion of the bridge here. In three years it took, there was only one fatality. A worker was on one of the footers riverside. During the winter time, he fell into the water. His co-workers promptly pulled him out, but he still succumbed to pneumonia. James J. Hill, though, was adamant about not wanting to pay out to the widow, going to whatever lengths that he could. Uh, if you go to the archives in Minneapolis or St. Paul, pull up this gentleman's death certificate. Under cause of death listed, you will see a, quote, lack of valor there. A good way to get some bad juju there. Uh, now, the, 
construction of the bridge. The main two places it got its stone from was a quarry in southern Minnesota, as well as what would have been an island pretty much roughly behind us on the other side of the bridge. This place was called Spirit Island in the Dakota. This is where that uh, woman with her children washed up upon when she went over the falls, and it became a sacred burial ground for some noted Dakota leaders. Uh, to the makers of the bridge, it was a great nearby source of limestone. I think regardless of any culture or context, if you use someone's sacred burial grounds for your construction in the bridge, you're just asking for something bad to happen on there. Uh, in more recent times, the area right over here where I guess those people are having a bonfire or whatever over there, last year we had some stories in the Minneapolis area of body parts being found along the air, uh, like along the riverside here. This was where the second body was, or the second body drop was found uh, in this kind of swampy foresty area. I was on a Segway tour actually over in uh, the park over there when the news story came out. That's my alibi. I was at work. Stop pressing me on that, guys. No, I'm just kidding. The other actual body drop was found a little bit further up Main Avenue, a little bit off the Segway course there. So if the third one happened to come up along the Segway route, I was going to start turning in whoever was most suspicious among my coworkers there. Uh, so I'm going to give you guys, if you guys want any time taking photos here, definitely I'll give you a few minutes here. We've got the skyline. you got the mills here. If you want me to take any photos of the two of you, let me know. This would be the worst part in town to like gun it in your car because there's so many crosswalks, alleys, and bricks here. It has to just do a number on it. I never do. But so the building across the street from us is our stop here. This would have been the home of the Satterley and Salisbury Mattress Factory. I like to describe a mattress factory as kind of like a fruit salad and all the worst parts of this old industrial labor. It was metalworks, spring making, textiles everything you should have a small child do. Uh, now, that was in this building for until like about the 1920s and 30s there. Then it just kind of went through different uh, different ownership, different factories. But the main thing is this is where those rumors of child labor came from. It was all in this building here. And then they would go to the soap factory over there. Uh, since then, they've really, as you guys can see, kind of transformed it. At first, the uh, upper floors there became kind of office spaces, and then the main floor here and below became restaurants. The upper floors, we've seen some weird uh, orbs in those windows moving pretty fast across the building, through the windows, up and down. Uh, last year on one of my tours, I had a gentleman who is a descendant of the Satterley family, who was one of the owners of the building. He was not aware of his family's history. I'm the best way to learn about your deepest, darkest family secrets, it seems like there. Uh, now, I will say this is going to be the worst joke on the tour, so just prepare yourselves here. Uh, from its roots as the Salisbury Mattress Factory to its current day as the Hideaway Burger Bar, truly this building has a meaty history to it. Sorry, I told you it was going to be the worst joke on the tour there. I gave you the warning fair. So, on that crescendo, I have some good news and some bad news. Bad news is that's all the history I have for us on the tour. We're going to be just heading back to the building here uh, after I finish up here. Good news is when we get back, I have some free things for you. I got a free pass to the Mill City Museum across the uh, river from us here. Uh, it's a pretty cool place for an hour or two. It gives you a little bit of the history of the Riverside and Minneapolis in general. It has uh, some really cool views in the area there. So you'll be getting those on the back counter there. If there's anything in Oh, wow. It is 11.19 right now. <sighs> this is the most worn out I've been in a while. Feels good. I got like 45 minutes worth of footage that I'm going to try and cut down to as uh, short as possible. I'm not going to cut out everything, but I'm in the middle of transferring uh, the one clip that I got on my phone over to the computer. And for those of you who didn't realize what happened, I went on what was called a ghost tour, or what they, they called a ghost tour. They went around, showed us a few locations, explained the history of a couple mills and all that stuff, so. My whole body hurts, though. I spent more time walking today, so, uh, than I usually do. Combine that with the fact that I got run over and I don't exercise. I'm just worn out. I feel good. I'm not complaining. I do feel good. But, I guess one thing I could say is, don't let yourself get out of shape like I have. <laughs>